Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the sixth discussion of SF Masterworks Reading Group. Today we are discussing the fifth book in the series, uh, The Stars, My Destination by Alfred Bester. We are reading the books in uh, the order they were published as masterworks, so not in their original publication order, but in the order that Collangs put them out as masterworks. We had to break up Cities in Flight into two. Um, that's why this is the fifth book, but sixth discussion. Uh, we are reading these one every month, and all the planning for it happens on the Patreon forum. So if you'd like to uh, join this reading group, either here for the discussions or just on the forum for conversational discussions, do consider checking out the Patreon forum. The books coming up for the next three months, um, so you can plan and purchase a copy if you need, and if that's uh, if any of these are interesting for you, uh, coming up first is uh, Babel 17 by Samuel R. Delaney. Uh, next is A Lot of Light by Roger Zelazny. And then the book after that is uh, The Fifth Head of Cerberus. All of these are fairly short, so we don't anticipate needing to break them up. So that's Q1 sorted for you for this reading group. Um, with me, I have the usual group of friends with whom we've done um, half a year's worth of discussion and plan to do 15 years more, more of. Uh, Susanna, would you like to start us off with introductions? Hello, my name is Susanna Imaginario. I'm a writer and sometimes YouTuber at Ten of the Weird. Livia. Hello everyone, I'm an author as well. I write interactive fiction and I host a podcast known as uh, Books and Done. Jared. <laughs> I am Jared. I run the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel and um, I uh, also haunt the page chewing forums. Uh, my name is Chris Mullen, sometimes YouTuber, sometimes appear on other people's channels, having fun discussions like this, and uh, not an author of any shape or form, <laughs> but a uh, commenter on, on books such as these. Nice. So did anyone else um, go start reading The Count of Monte Cristo immediately after they finished the book? Oh, no, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to. I mean, I thought about it. It's been on my list for a while. Yeah. Have have you all yeah. read it? Has anybody read it? No? Okay. Yeah, Several years, years ago. ago. <laughs> yeah, years yeah. ago in Portuguese. I want to read it in English, even though it's not the original, but yeah, I think I need to read it again. Hmm. I I saw in the introduction that this is uh, one of the influences or inspirations mm -hmm. for the book. And um I wanted to see how um, Dumas did in 1,200 pages <laughs> what uh, Bester did in 250. <laughs> um, and also, like, I, I really enjoyed the story. It was moving fast, like you mentioned, Jared. It moved really fast. And I saw from the introduction of Monte Cristo that the main story follows all the same beats. So, um, yeah, I, I wanted to read the, I don't want to call it original, but the influence that this is based on, I guess. <laughs> now, this being a, um, the comparison with Monte Cristo, uh, is it uh, because it's a revenge story, basically? Is mm -hmm. that the, uh, okay, that's what I thought. Okay. In, in the, I believe it's actively stated as an influence or inspiration for the story. Yeah. Um, and also Gaiman mentions in the uh, Afterwards, yeah, yeah, that it uh, is um, that it's inspired by a quote in Monte Cristo. So I don't know if it's the entire story. It it does follow a lot of similar beats, but um, <clears throat> apparently there's a quote that triggered this. So I, I can't wait to read kind of Monte Cristo to see all the jaunting around that. That's gonna be oh. good. <laughs> <laughs> 19th century jaunting. Wow. <laughs> But in terms of jumping, I think that the movie from the 2000s, Jumper, it was a very clear inspiration for this one. Because after mm. reading the book, I was just like, this is so similar. It has mm. same, yeah. It's not as uh, very well done, but it has several concepts. Mm. I, I, I was a bit uh, alarmed because it's very similar to the translocation uh, that my gods use 
uh, to move around the universe. <laughs> I, was like, I have no idea, but it's exactly the same principle. Yeah. But they yeah. don't have, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. I mean, this seems like one of those books that probably had an influence on a lot of other uh, writers that came yeah. after. Um, and so definitely that idea of teleportation or what have you is, uh, is was in popular culture and uh i don't know if he is one of the originators of that idea or if he just took full advantage of it and you mm. know it made it the center piece of his his scientific idea basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah but even when you have that idea i think that this book excels in the aftermath you know you have humans suddenly have this skill to jones and they it changed society and I have seen, for example, the movie Jumper that I mentioned, it didn't touch on that. It was very light. And this one is actually all around the consequences of people suddenly having these skills and using yeah. it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. I, th I think it's very interesting that, um, I guess it's 1956, isn't it? The, the Stars of My Destination. Um, yeah. It sort of uses a lot of the comic book superhero theory as it's, as its thing so the, the jumping only really happened under high high pressure and high tension in the body and the body could then perform to a higher level obviously the mother did this kind of discovery of things and like again we, we've already talked about like films like jumper you know all that kind of stuff but like the pervasiveness of, of this kind of story or these kind of ideas have kind of leaked through lots of lots of different stories uh whether in this genre directly or not yeah but it definitely uh, the idea that the behind a jaunting is definitely changed society uh, drastically. Um, yeah. And uh, so that was uh, like he says in the prologue and how everything occurred over the next 500 years. Once this, yeah. once this um, ability was discovered, um, it's kind of, I, I found it kind of funny that um, they had those, those jumping, stations the platforms yeah. the platforms where people would just you know <laughs> jaunt in and out like a almost like a uh grand central station and in, in a subway station or something like that and as i find that kind of amusing that uh correlation there yeah and, and the fact that it, they were calculated for the traffic on the different days and what yeah. i also found interesting is how it changed architecture you know mm -hmm. and the houses and the distribution because even the houses were different. They had no windows. They had this laboring to prevent people from jumping. And I thought that was ingenious. Like one of those details that show that the world has been thought out and that the mm -hmm. consequences of that new skill has been thought out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And also uh, one other thing that I thought was really interesting in that aspect was uh, time is now a luxury that the rich people can spend uh, yeah. extravagantly. Yeah. So instead of jaunting, which is considered uh, what not up to their uh, class, they use trains or planes and you take the longer <laughs> means to travel because they, <laughs> I suppose, because they have the money and they can spend the time. Yeah, <laughs> jaunting so pedestrian, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, uh, like, something mm -hmm. interesting as well. Sorry, on that, no, no, that they started classifying people. You know, mm -hmm. humans and our need to classify everything and depending on the distance they can jaunt. Mm -hmm. And I found that interesting because for the courier, um, he has he ensures that he has people that can jump, I think, a thousand miles per jump mm -hmm. or something like that. And the others were looked like these desert beings that couldn't jump that far. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And our main character is classified in the beginning as not very remarkable, right? Uh, yeah. There is um, one other thing about society was we explored John Ting in a lot of detail. We talked about how, uh, the author talks about how society changed throughout, but there's a lot of other things that happened in the or other things that we wouldn't recognize, right? Like um, full fledged androids who do butler service for you and things like that. Um, the cancellation of uh, organized religion. And uh, that's not exactly a technological advancement, but a lot of societal changes that 
aren't attributed to jaunting, but are just sort of thrown in there as this is how people live in this time, which I thought was very interesting. I think all the consequences of jaunting were mentioned. And for a long time through the book, until almost the end, I kept wondering why the focus on jaunting, because there's a lot of other things that he's done differently from current times that he's not going into the detail of. It became clear when the ending happened. But um, I thought that was an interesting approach. And I I think, um, I'm not sure if we saw a lot of it in Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, but I feel like P.K. Dick uh, does that a lot um, in his books where there's one aspect that we're exploring, but then there's so many other things that are also happening in society, Um, like doors that can talk and so on. I forget if that was in, no, that was in Ubik. But yeah, I I thought that was really interesting how that was done because um, the other books they are, that, that we've read so far, they were, almost exclusively just explorations of the thing of the sci-fi concept that they are based around uh, cities in flight definitely so but it just like did the one thing and then it was stagnant from there on didn't show any following <laughs> societal advances as in like cities can fly because we have this th- anti grab thing now but um forever war it showed how society changed but the only technology thing it explored was the faster than light or like close sorry relativistic speed um travel yeah that i thought that was just very interesting yeah it's a common uh uh theme with all these books that they have mm-hmm. their their one thought idea and that's what they explore um and uh you know besta did give us some space travel and he did give us other yeah. aspects of stuff but th- definitely was the one theme his his thought idea was the jaunting mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the yeah it, that was just casually thrown in there that this is how people live now right like the outer planets and it had nothing to do with the settling of the outer planets had nothing to do with jaunting because right. you cannot jaunt that far which also was interesting but it, but it also talked about how jaunting did sort of affect the idea of trade Mm. Uh, and I had sort of broke down the concept of trade. And I suppose if you think about it, if like we spend an awful lot of resource on Earth at the moment, like a lot of our resources are spent in energy. And mm-hmm. if you have an energy free way of traveling about through like short, medium, long term distances, like if that economy is then taken out immediately, like mm-hmm. that have a very jarring effect on world economies and all of that kind of stuff very, very quickly. And even when it mm. went to the point of exploring how I affected incarceration because that's kind of you kind of did that kind of thing of like oh god i hadn't thought about that yeah, yeah. Like, how are they going to keep people locked up if you just kind of put them in a yeah. cell and then next minute they're outside the cell you know <laughs> so it's yeah, like and, and the cruelty the yeah and the cruelty of what they do they're doing that lobotomy and oh yes hurting people to actually take their ability to jump away so mm. mm-hmm. locking women for the sake of their virtue, yes, that <laughs> yes, uh, I was cringing on that one. Yeah, a little cringy, yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. That, I think that would exactly that's exactly how we would go. We just lock people yeah. in, so they they would jump, or no one would get inside the house. Yeah, I can see that happening. And at some point, at cultures. some point, I think it's it's implied that they can not not even work, right? Not only being locked away, but there is mm-hmm. one character that kinds of implies. Women can't even work. Yeah, I I think um, Gully Foyle thought the captain of the ship that he was trying to find uh, had to probably the only way she could have captained it was if she dressed as a man. Uh, that seems to be um, his implication. There, I I agree about the societal breakdown and the consequences of trade over it that absolutely makes sense and how he explored it there was one thing that i felt was uh maybe sort of not just sort of brushed over and not dealt with in detail he did say that you need to be able to um you need to know a place very intimately to be able to jaunt to it or from it Mm -hmm. 
which means that the traditional means of travel have to still be there for you to know every place that you might ever want to go to so that you can join. So I, I would imagine that it would be like air flight now, you know, um, that we don't always take a plane. <laughs> we still like car and walking is still the primary means of travel. It's just some things we can do through air. Uh, I imagine that that's how it would be. So it it should not have the way he's designed it. It should not have led to a total breakdown. But wherever we went, it's like oh, trains don't run anymore, buses don't. Uh, I don't know what he said about roadways, but your premise that <laughs> um, we need to see a place should mean that you still this the primary way of move, getting around cannot be jaunting. Yeah, that's a good point. That that's kind of similar to how cell phones changed how we communicate. You know, mm -hmm. um, the all the old ways of communication are still there for the most part, but we, you know, the cell phone vastly changed how we communicate. So it's uh, it's an interesting uh, point there. I like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we do suspend disbelief, though, I loved all the. Um expansion he did from there with the mazes in people's houses and uh, everything else that we just talked about. I thought that was a lot of detail that I really appreciated in the book. Yeah. Uh, did, um, did you all? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Another detail that I wanted to bring in about that is maybe related to a current times, but he says in the book that uh, new diseases came up the diseases that were no longer happening started and uh, all of that was because people were moving around so mm -hmm. much and that they were no contention and things like that and i thought that was quite a human behavior you know <laughs> like he went up to so many details to think that society mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah did this also felt to me slightly different from the other books that we have read in that it seemed to be um this world seemed to be just a setting for a different story you know it wasn't just uh exploring like i, I guess it builds on top of what i said earlier it's not just exploring that theme it's a backdrop for a revenge story which i thought was really again interesting and different from the masterwork stuff it, it did explore ideas a lot but the main story <laughs> isn't the idea exploration it's this mad dude who wants revenge for like <laughs> sir he was something else <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it very much was a case of the first couple of chapters set up a lot of the ideas <laughs> and then parked it it was like yeah. okay there's there's our tool set that we're going to make our way around this book and we're going to get into this what is essentially like a, a road movie in a lot of ways as he moves his point from place to place to kind of find out a bit more about where these people are the people who perpetrated this ill that he mm -hmm. thinks has been put on them uh, and that's really what the central part of that comes down to and then about his relationships with a couple of people along the way that he uses and abuses and then steps clear of and then comes back around to and you know that aspect of society, you know, his single mindedness and his and his calls. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really felt like uh, an action movie the way uh, yeah. the yeah. way the way it was portrayed and how um like because uh, I was reading it and I was reading it it, it kind of the prose kind of put me in the mood to read it like an action movie. Mm -hmm. I wanted to mm -hmm. read it quickly because. I had to find out what kind of nonsense he was getting up to in the next <laughs> in the next chapter because he was like some of his decisions were so off the wall and crazy that you're like what's he going to do next to get to go into his revenge phase and some of the stuff he pulls off is is a uh, it's it's a little crazy because he like how he suddenly got this whole new identity um, yeah <laughs> and that that seemed a little. <laughs> a little too quickly done That's in that in that point, but uh, but it was just um, but it was just one crazy thing to the next. Like whenever I ended a chapter, I was like, "What? 
And then it went to the next chapter, <laughs> and he's doing something else equally as crazy as he did in the last chapter. And uh, and it made me, it made me, it gave me um, like this this weird energy to keep to keep going and keep finding out what he's going to be up to next. And uh, I think Bester pulled that that ability to draw you into the action off very well. Yeah, it was quite easy to read as well. Like it will just flow the story, and sometimes it was borderline absurd like at the <laughs> start main character just wants to destroy the ship as if until somebody tells him like no you actually have to go after the people and he didn't realize yeah like he <laughs> <laughs> so I just blow up the <laughs> ship <laughs> oh, yeah. he, he had a brute mentality there was no doubt about that yeah <laughs> exactly everything he tries is always force brute force first and if that doesn't work, somebody else gives him an idea, and that happens all the time. Yeah, and, and he grasped onto that idea full force. He doesn't let go of it. Like when uh, when she gave him the idea that he needs to think about, um, who, you know, going after the person responsible, he uh, he then went bullheaded full force into that idea, you know, and uh, and so he was he was consistent in that way. <laughs> mm. It, it wasn't even a personal slight, was it? They just decided not to help the ship. I don't even think they knew who was in it. <laughs> uh, I I think the book that it is based on, Monte Cristo, it is a personal slight that uh, he goes after people for revenge. So this was, I suppose, an interesting take on... I didn't buy into his reasons. The way I explained it to myself was he went mad <laughs> from six months of isolation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, <laughs> he, this is all he can think of now, or this is what he needs to continue living. Or I guess, yeah, I don't know. Like he's had some sort of psychological breakdown because of which uh, as, this yeah. is his whole purpose. Well, as barbaric as he was, right, personally, he did have this sense of you don't do that to a pedestrian mm -hmm. uh, to a to a to uh, to a uh uh you know like the old uh samaritan thing a car mm -hmm. pulled over and somebody's in trouble you don't do that that and that was his his focus like you just don't do that to somebody who's broken down on the side of the space line in this case you know and uh and that was his uh you know his his it was almost like a uh a commentary on society and how society should act towards one another rather mm -hmm. than a personal affront that somebody insulted him or somebody did I, it wrong. I didn't see it that way. I, I saw it as it a didn't. personal affront. He didn't care about anything or even about himself that much until that slight. It, it was that, how dare you do that to me? And mm -hmm. that that was the, the drive. And, you know, you go online and everything. Everyone takes everything personally in these days. Um, it, it, it was just the basic nature of his personality, you know, the, the average yeah, man. That's that's absolutely true. Yeah. It, it, but he uh, he didn't know who it was though at first. You know, it didn't he was, matter. He was just going. Didn't yeah, matter. it didn't matter. His his brute mind was just like go after it. <laughs> the sheep. Go destroy the sheep, and suddenly he said it. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah. I, I think at its core, I think that's one of the reasons why. You don't like Gully because it is sort of irrational. The whole thing's kind of yeah. irrational. It's not worth, yeah. or it is not built up as being enough justification for him to commit atrocities. Which is why we, as the reader, sort of find him this unlikable. He's an anti-hero in a lot of ways yeah. uh, in the story, and and it makes it sort of hard to root for him, but sort of fascinated by the destruction destruction that he kind of causes in his mm. wake. Mm. Oh, uh, He's a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought it was also quite a setup for the end, you know, like this terrible people person that we see throughout doing the most awful things throughout the book suddenly is the only one with a bit of common sense at the end of what may happen. And I think and all of the other characters that we think are somewhat rational, they mm. I don't want to spoil the end, but uh, they end up taking a different, more conservative approach, you know, to the solution. And uh, I was thinking the same, that he was, he is extremely unlikable, but at the end, it was perhaps a means to an end, you know, a means for the author to make that commentary. Mm. 
Oh, that's nice. I didn't think of it like that. But what you said makes a lot of sense. I had a gripe with the ending, actually, because I uh, felt like he went from being uh, the single-minded uh, person to, well, first, I don't know why he turned himself in, what changed his mind. And also he um, he uh, preaches about the right thing to do. And that felt like too much of a flip, but maybe, Livia, you're mm. right in that it's not a flip. It's just what he is shown to be simple minded, I suppose. And that's he's just thinking about it in the simplest of terms. And that's what it leads him to, perhaps. Yeah, I like, mm -hmm. I like that interpretation. It's a, it's a non religious society, isn't it? Isn't that one mm. of the things that the makes towards the end and so far as he his rage was literally written all over his face every time that yeah. he went into something that was literally came out in his face and it was only when he came down to contrition and forgiveness and being taken uh, account of his actions that he was able to control the physical appearance of his rage as much as his his underlying thing and that's when he became this kind of almost morose almost likable character at the end as he kind of wanted to atone for the things that he had done mm. but this this society that he stepped into he was still a very like was a, a super capitalist version of our society if you know what i mean there was this kind of ideas i actually wrote down some of the names of of the companies that they thought would last the task test of time like kodak and stuff uh and i was like ah, that, that that right. yeah, yeah indeed. <laughs> uh, but the fact that they would use kind of avatars of the same people so that every store that you walked into kodak store you'd meet the same person and that you know this like very heightened sense of capitalism and that it takes a revolutionary or a single person or a single driven person to actually shake that up in some way because the system will change itself without those people yeah mm -hmm. yeah that that makes sense and there was something towards the end that um i thought was like it felt like it was making commentary against capitalism which i suppose it is throughout the book but it was really speaking out in the end with i can't find where I wrote it down, but yeah, uh, it it that was an interesting view on society, and it didn't feel like it was appreciating the view uh, either, right? All most of these people were shown to be somewhat corrupt. The pristine dude, uh, oh, and he, I don't know about the others, but he says, "No, you can't, you can't swear inside my house." stop that he stops it every time someone says the word damned or whatever so apparently organized religion is abolished and you have to go underground to practice it but you can be critical of people who aren't come conforming to your religious practices that seems to be okay or is it because he's a richer person so he gets a free pass <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that was interesting because he um, he even explained at some point that the colloquialism that they he used like God damn or whatever it was, uh, or no Jesus, he, Jesus Christ, right? He said he said a swear, right, right, and uh, they were trying they were just he was discussing it with, where that came from with with uh, one of the other characters, and uh, and she had to explain it to him like where that where that came from <laughs> and i found that that i found that interesting and then uh but he also um when he sees his his burning self he also equates that with the uh, older ideas of religion mm. um yeah until you know until the end we actually find out it was him but yeah but it, it uh i thought that was very interesting as well you know Oh, yeah, he does keep saying, I'm going to hell, I'm going mm. to hell, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize yeah. the incongruity of that in the non-religious <laughs> society. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and he, um, and, and of course, whenever he was uh, um, captured and being interrogated, <laughs> and I just love how he just kept repeating, go to hell, go to hell, go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Every time they asked yeah. him a question, <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. But <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I didn't think it was a plot hole, but more of what Jarrod said, like that idea of these concepts are so detached from the original and now coming back as we just use them. And if mm -hmm. you think of it, there are many phrases that we still use in the day-to-day -day life 
that are mm. like that, that have that meaning and nowadays we just use it without knowing where they come from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, happens a lot. yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. And, and as far as the, um, the, the uh, capitalism thing, uh, and I think he's telling us that capitalism is the status quo mm. in this book and mm -hmm. that, um, and this guy, Gully Foil, is the character that, that that he's the foil to bring the change to the mm. status quo you know he's he's the mm. he's the chaos introduced into that into that capitalistic uh yeah you know, against that mm -hmm. and and uh, some mm -hmm. sorry go ahead no go ahead go ahead yes. Regarding that capitalism, something that I found quite interesting is the fact that at the end, the climax of a book is when they decide to give, quote unquote, the power back to people by giving them those bombs, the fire bombs that are and scattering them. Foil does, them, does that without actually telling the others, but they react in a way such as like, how are you going to give people this mm -hmm. power, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think of capitalism, it could be anything else. It could be money or power or property or whatever but it's the same idea of distributing something to a group of people and making it even yeah scary too <laughs> yeah <laughs> the um, whole idea of the bombs is quite interesting the fact that anybody with a good idea or literally will can actually make them implode and, and they are they are presented as being so destructive everything in this book goes around the will of people, the individual or the society to join and everything. I think the main theme of it is actually what we can achieve as humans if we put our minds to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think of it like that, but that that's really cool. <laughs> that's a really cool way of thinking yeah. about it. But it also brings up the questions of how much power do you give to people right yeah yeah i mean we don't want just anybody having the the, the switch to the to nuclear weapons right and you wouldn't want anybody having a switch to this bomb type technology either so he does he leaves it up in the air at the end you know as far as what's going to happen with that but uh it is a question raised yeah and um uh, that that makes a lot of, like you can see the argument for it that the power shouldn't be in the hands of right. a few uh, shown to be somewhat disturbed people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but also, <laughs> if Gully Foyle had it when he was at his speak <laughs> seeking vengeance phase and he knew where Vorga was, then you know, you know what's going to happen. And he's probably not going to stop with using a milligram or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. it would take uh, but also apparently if you blow one up you blow them all up it didn't seem like you could direct will at a specific chunk of it you do at everything that exists on the planet which yeah is interesting but you know that that's basically what you're giving people the power to destroying the planet Nuclear How weapons, do you ever like really? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it's the argument against nuclear weapons from having having certain countries mm -hmm. have it, not certain countries do you have it? You know, it's exactly the, exactly mm -hmm. the same argument and stuff. And really, the idea that you shouldn't allow other people to have it is because you want to hold the power. It's nothing to do with the technology yeah. or anything else. It's it's a threat, really, to say that uh, I hold the power and I and I should be able to have control of society because of this, like these twenty pounds of. Of power or whatever they want to call yeah. it. Yeah, pie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose it's vastly different. E even giving governments power over something like this is kind of bad. But there is enough safeguard there, I suppose. It's it's a whole body of people. It's not one person. Uh but here it's a very rich dude who wants control of the of the ability to destroy even the solar system it seems like based on how it was described hmm. yeah i am here imagining a a sequel where uh, you know earth is destroyed and it's the the science people or however they were called that go venture into the stars 
Oh, we did. Oh, man. Yeah. We did <laughs> that, that part was painful to my own. Yeah. <laughs> it was so funny at the same time. Oh, it was it was it was scary and sad. Um, but yeah, now I'm here imagining the sequel. But that's probably yeah, <laughs> the sequel just finished playing in my head. It um... <laughs> something about the science people that got me thinking is like how everything can be distorted by time. Yeah. You know? Like they were even using very specific things and the way they talked about like, oh, that's very scientific, they would say. And it was funny, like how much time had they been isolated not to know where specific things come from and the symbols and the tattoos that they had. <laughs> but it, it also showed the, you know, the knowledge that we remained, you know, with the things that they considered important or more important society, you know, yeah. what was passed on. They, mm. uh, yeah, they completely, I don't know, regressed um, to, yeah, regressed. They had no no idea what they were talking about. It's just very sad. <laughs> it was almost like a religion of, uh, religion of science, yeah. you know, like talking yeah. about like. They, they had yeah. all the lingo, but the, the thought process was gone the mindset was gone. There was very little exploration of a common man, though. I mean, the, the, we didn't actually just get to see what state society was in, in terms of, like, it's, you know, the education of the people, even the kind of jobs the people did, you know, on mm -hmm. a day-to-day -day basis, you know, what, what way society was doing. It was all done on this kind of high level, and then this rampaging idiot kind of going yeah. through the middle of it, kind <laughs> of <laughs> shaking, shaking it all up. So we, we didn't really get the sense of how smart society was or where it was evolved, what kind of evolved state it was at, other than it was sort of controlled by these mega corporations or otherwise, which, you know, could looks like the way we're heading, you know? Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. It's kind of, of a digression, but uh, why did they change the title? Because Tiger Tiger, it's a much better title, in my opinion. You know, it fitted the story a lot better. The stars is the stars my destination. It made it sound like a very mild, slow, peaceful mm. book. But no, it is. <laughs> it doesn't stop. It, it's relentless. It's just one thing happening after the other, uh, just pouncing, pouncing, pouncing from scene to subject to, to idea to, uh, so yeah, Tiger, I'll Tiger. I wonder if it was because it's quite a famous poem, if that, if that makes sense. You know, it, it has its uh, own infamy within literature. Uh, but I, I did find it fascinating how he took the names of people from, like, the uh, the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought yeah. was brilliant. <laughs> like, that's so good. Anything is inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Yuval, Sheffield. Like, it's brilliant. It's like... <laughs> It was like, oh, okay, they, these, these are all cities. And now, and why? <laughs> it took me a while to try to understand did what he, I was reading. Did he not know he was picking city names or did or were these <laughs> cities named after last names that were prevalent at the time? No, I think it was very much just he made his way. He like, picked the, the names of the places that he liked within the phone book, thinking he was kind of writing it for... A non-British audience, I think, is, is is kind of what he thought, and he could use these what he thought was cool names like the Oval. <laughs> <laughs> How that becomes the virtue of uh, of interestingness or, or otherwise, uh, but I just thought, well, well, like, but sort of put some people up in the pedestal. You know, somebody's written a really great piece of fiction here, or one that's very accepted, but yet he couldn't do names. He just got a phone book. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> It, so is the author American? Is that uh, why no, he? I that? think he's British. I think, or oh. certainly was living in Britain when he when he wrote it. I think that was the that was the thing. Because I was yeah. sort of fascinated by that a little bit myself in terms of where it came from. Because obviously, you know, Tiger Tiger being a a, a British literary work, mm. uh, he was born in New York. There he go. was born in New York. Yeah. 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 Yeah, these things are interesting. Like, if you had asked me to guess if Naomi Novik was British, I would have said, hell yes, but she's not, based on the <laughs> Temerere series. <laughs> yeah, he was, uh, lived in New York for many years, then he went to Pennsylvania, so. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sort of anglophile, fascinated uh, by British place names then, obviously, you know. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's um what was i going to say yeah that the stars my destination was from the little nursery rhyme at the very That's end right. of the book there yeah, yeah. Mm. but uh i didn't was it originally titled tiger tiger is that it was it was yeah okay That's in, cool. i didn't know that in the gaming uh afterward it says that in the magazine it was published as the stars my destination and then but the book was published as Tiger Tiger. At least that's what I interpreted. It doesn't say so explicitly. Hmm. But then in the US, when yeah, in UK, it was uh, Tiger Tiger. And then it was republished in the US under the original 1956 Galaxy magazine title, The Stars, My Destination. So I suppose that was the original title for the magazine publication. I did feel like it gave away the ending a lot more than tiger tiger would have like i i would i don't know how likely it was that i would have guessed um this dude's capability at the end but uh with tiger tiger but the star is my destination sort of makes it clear if not gully foil that someone can jaunt across space because <laughs> because why else yeah. is the book called that <laughs> um yeah what did you guys think it's it's also yeah. a very sci-fi sounding name. Like Tiger yeah. Tiger isn't, you know, stars my destinations <laughs> is very aspirationally kind of looking looking upwards and outwards, which a lot of, I'd say a lot of those public stories were trying to to yeah. Uh, yeah. give you to think, you know, to get you to read them. Yeah. The 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 sci-fi titles are very poetic. I think a lot of them I like I tend to like them a lot more than <laughs> the fantasy titles for some reason. Like uh the Ada Palmer series, she has two, like The Lightning, and then uh, Perhaps the Stars, I think, is the last book. Mm. I love the names. Uh, well, like the, the Becky Chambers books and stuff like that, very much play oh, yeah. on that idea as well, you know, The Long Way, The Lonely Planet, and all of that kind of yeah. stuff. You know, yeah. uh, they, they send a riff on these very classic mm. sci-fi titles uh, from the 50s, 60s. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's really good. I love the titles of Becky Chambers yeah. books. <laughs> Amazing. Um, a question I have uh, probably probably best for Jared because this book, more so than any of the other books that we've read so far, remind me much more of the pulpy sci-fi kind of we like, lower rent kind of sci-fi that, that was about that time. It was definitely had more of a feel of that. And I know you've read some of those, you know, much more than I have. Uh what I would call the Hardy Boys style versions of sci-fi. Uh, and and in, in, in some ways, I this might be not proper. I didn't think this was particularly well written, <laughs> and I know that I know from like um uh, hearing like Moy did Media Death Cult's review, he thought it was. I find a lot of the action very like compared to modern like style. I think that's probably because we see an awful lot more of this kind of stuff in movies where this wouldn't have happened, obviously, in movies at the time. I find a lot of the action action a bit kind of ham-fisted for a lot of it or it was very kind of small in scale whereas if it was written today it would have been written very differently hmm. uh I, I mean i think the action scenes in here uh relate very much to those to the pulp uh yeah the pulp magazines of um you know the not weird tales but the other ones that were coming out in the in the 30s and yeah. 40s probably um and he probably had a big influence uh, from those. Um, this style is is very much in tune with those type of magazines. Uh, but I I didn't find it any lacking as far as the action scenes. I mean, it, it it's it's dated, uh, but um, but I uh, I I don't know. I I kind of I kind of enjoyed it. I I'm not really big into um, some of the more I mean, I haven't read a lot of action novels, you know, modern ones, but um, but I, I I don't prefer over description in in action mm -hmm. uh, scenes, like when uh, there's there's been a lot of over description of gun battles and sword fights that have just gone on and on and on. And I just feel like that could be. I always feel like it could be a bit more economical in some of the yeah. more modern writing that when uh, when it comes to action scenes um but that's a generalization i mean i didn't have a problem with it. i i really uh i kind of dug it because i i kind of liked <laughs> his need 
to make you find turn the page and find out what Keep happened going, next. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. Interesting. I think it's also more of an, an element of these sci-fi masterworks. They were more focused on the theme and the things that they were exploring and the rest of it, it's just a context, you know, and uh, you may have long expositions or scenes related to the theme of a book and the rest is just very small. Sorry, that's my cat. He wants to be on YouTube. <laughs> Welcome. Got a point to make. <laughs> uh, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but unlike like cities in flight though was painful the stuff yes. around the uh, the stuff around the themes and this wasn't painful at all this was no enjoyable. no it wasn't. no, no. and uh, do Android dreams I thought that the fight scenes on that one were not that good they were generally shows point the gun shoot that's it yeah I agree yeah. with that that the fight scenes were kind of just quick and uh, almost like a side thought. <laughs> yeah. Did anybody feel any peril at any stage in the book? Was it just kind of just there was an absence of it in this book? If if you know what I mean. Whereas at least I think in the Androids there was a kind of probably moments where he was in the the other police station. You kind of thought, oh, there's threat here. But in this case, I don't think Gully ever felt like he was under threat. Even the even the kind of mock deaths that he has a couple of times where they kind of allude to the fact that oh, he's dead now. Oh no, he's yeah. not. Um, <laughs> a couple of times, I don't think he ever really felt, or maybe he didn't care so much if he did come to a bad end. Maybe that mm -hmm. was part of it. Yeah, I think that's why he had to be so unlikable. I mean, uh, uh, as a reader, you, you wouldn't care what happened to him. It was very hard to to sympathize with any of his struggles. I mean, he suffered a lot. You know, he was left in space. He was he had an encounter with the space people that was pretty bad, and then abandoned again barely survived, then was in jail, terrible conditions. But we don't feel sorry for him at any point. You know, we, we can still appreciate the story completely detached from his uh, from his suffering. Uh, we can't understand why, <laughs> why he's doing what he's doing, but we don't really care. We are, in, we are just interested in everything else, which I thought he was mm. brilliant um, in that regard. Yeah, it, really was, it like, was hard for me. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, I liked some of the aspects of the prose, the dialogue, uh, not the dialect that he used, but throughout the book, the dialogue, the bits of the dialogue, they were really, really good. That's why, and then the, the way that he just, you, you didn't need to have <clears throat> those huge des descriptions of the scenes of what was going on because you, you could get that just by the, the conversation. Even mm -hmm. ca uh, characterization and everything was through dialogue, it was very, very clever. Yeah, I agree with that. There, there, there was very a lot of clever dialogue in there. That, uh, that yeah, like you said, it led to the characterization of the character, the dialogue itself. Yeah, that was very well done. I thought. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did think that it was really difficult to take Gully Foil seriously, and I guess it wasn't intended that we ever do take him seriously. Uh, but to your point, Chris. Uh, there were some other things that this book does that uh, felt different from most of the books I've read from recent times, or even for that matter, I I'm only 30 pages in from how Count of Monte Cristo does it, in that we don't get an inside perspective into any of our characters. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's hard to take Foil seriously, because everything that he's doing from an external perspective is clownish to the like he goes and establishes a circus it's meant to be clownish but we it's hard to get behind and i don't think it's necessary that we do uh, anything or understand anything <laughs> about what he's about because we don't get an inside perspective into what why he's doing what he is same with most of the other characters we don't know how any of them um what any of them are thinking and also their reactions to me didn't feel immediately decipherable you know like okay uh this person is reacting in you could argue that in movies we don't get inside perspectives you're supposed to deduce from what's going on uh on screen and a lot of books do that too they don't give you a fully <laughs> inside perspective but you make sense of what's going on. I didn't feel like it was easy to make sense also 
of these. So, but I don't know if that's a more modern style to add uh, psychological elements of who's and motivations for why everyone's doing what they are, or if this is just a difference in the writing style for this author. <clears throat> I haven't read anything both. else. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, a bit of both, and 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 the character, his motivation was just the one motivation. It was very simple. That was established mm -hmm. from the beginning. Yeah. Everything else, I mean, we don't know anything about his childhood. We don't know anything about uh, what he did before he went to space. It doesn't matter. It's just it's one track mind, and that's all we need to know. And everything else. The other characters, we get very little as well. That's what I mean. If <clears throat> it might be the style at the time compared to what it is now, where you have to explain everything because otherwise people don't understand. I don't know. But uh, even the other characters, they, they were pretty much defined. They, they were all two dimensional. They, they were just defined by that one or two mot motivations. For it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know what? In any other book, that would probably annoy me. That this one, it it, it worked. It was. I, I think I, it was enough yeah. mo motivation to, to get the story going, which I'm, I was still trying to um, elaborate on that because I thought, um, how did you get away with this? You know, <laughs> 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 you had an engaging yeah. story with just two dimensional characters. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. I I thought it was a matter of the narrator. You know, nowadays we are very used to having either first person narrators, so you are always in the head, and third mm. person that are very biased and following a single character. And this narrator mm. is just like looking everybody as an external person observer. So that's what sometimes what we see people in reality, if you meet someone very fleetingly for a few moments, they may seem two dimensional in reality because you don't know them. And this narrator is the same. It's like an observer following everybody. And that's it. Mm -hmm. It's not fully omnipresent narrator, but just mm -hmm. kind of like an arrow one. And I thought I thought the same it worked for this story because the characters weren't that relevant. Everything else was. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with you, Susanna. Like it it worked <laughs> incredibly well yeah. for me. I uh I was thinking, like it's not one of my like favorite books ever, but it I did enjoy it enough to go want to read the story that it's based on, right? It mm -hmm. and I feel like it is, it has done, and, and I felt like the book was clever in a lot of ways. It did a lot of very clever things with the plot, so. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot missing, but I think there's a lot that works enough to make up for what I would look for in a book that I enjoy very much. It'd be interesting to see kind of Monte Cristo, given that it's what five times the length of this, <laughs> yeah. in a lot of ways, right? That that it maybe does fill out the bits that it doesn't shoot in this like even even our romance here like mm. if i was reading 1200 pages of of count of monte cristo and that was the level of romance that you were getting out of it i'd be very very annoyed with with the book yeah. whereas I, I sort of like how to choose that romance sort of to give it some gravitas as in the person that you're chasing is this person that you supposedly love although is fully capable of love any of that kind of stuff I, that all felt a bit weird but i'm glad it kind of threw all that out the window and went like the book's not about that I think, as I recall, the only parallel, is, pa uh, parallel with Count of Monte Cristo is um, the the revenge bit, the single mind and revenge, and the fact that you know the Count um, was imprisoned for many many years, and it was the thing that kept him going was uh, how many or how he would carry out his revenge. Um, the romance has nothing similar, not as far as I recall. And uh, the characters are very different. And the books themselves, I mean, in the Quantum Monte Cristo, you have pages and pages, hundreds of pages of all these motivations and thought process and how it's feeling and why isn't. Yeah. So uh, okay. <laughs> the Completely different in that regard. Uh, in uh, in Star's My Destination, he cut all that. We don't need all that. We just need the motive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The characters are designed to 
to just just to move along the thought the idea yeah, that's it yeah. <laughs> One other thing that I kind of had an issue with in t because we're talking about writing style is um, I wasn't always able to locate people. I don't know if it was because I wasn't paying enough attention or if there wasn't enough information. Like they'd be somewhere and then the next paragraph would, would indicate that they got out of there. <laughs> but I feel like the bit in between was missing to tell us how they got there or what changed in between. So, yeah, I did have trouble with that, but I don't know if that's a me problem. Uh, I, I find the same thing. That's what I'm talking about, some of yeah. the action, right? You know, the action scenes about how they're constructed. And then I, I just think it, it's very much of its time at that time when you, I think a lot of what our our language that we use is based on what we've seen in movies and kind of visuals, kind of stuff that we mm -hmm. see, whereas uh, it, it wasn't as prevalent then, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think it was just a, a, I think a thing of the time. Makes sense. Certainly, uh, for writing or something. But anyway, it, it, it was very cinematic. Um, just cut scene, scene, cut scene, another scene, another location, another scene, and um, <clears throat> you fill in the gaps. You know, two or three paragraphs in, you're like, oh yeah, also oh, this is what's happening. Oh, oh, this is what happened. Oh, great, and yeah, but it was always like two or three paragraphs. Brilliant, brilliant to them. Was this uh, taking notes? Was this ever adapted to a, a film or? I don't think so. Mm. I, mean, I could see it happening, you know, I taking could, the shell or bones of it, certainly and making yeah, it this because yeah. I think it could easily be adapted for a screenplay. It's yeah, it's, definitely. it's it's got uh, it's got that kind of quick dialogue and it's got that um, like you said, the quick scene changes and stuff like that. So it's kind of curious. I know it was adapted by uh, Howard Chaikin for comics um, back in the 80s, but uh, but I never liked his artwork, so I never read it. But <laughs> but uh, um, I'm just curious if it ever got, you know, maybe under another name or something, I don't know, it got that to do a film. But uh. I mean, there are many aspects in the story that we recognize, like the jumping jumper, etc. Right, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. I guess so much has been picked mm -hmm. and adapted, um, but I, I can't recall any movie or story that follows that exact yeah, character okay. and pattern. Yeah. I think it'd be an interesting movie because I think yeah. the movie that you'd have to make of it would end up being a lot more hard sci-fi than what the book is. If that makes yeah. sense, you know. I, I even though this is within the scheme of the, of the books that we've written, definitely the most kind of readable, the most story narrative driven uh, of these books that we've written. I think for the points that it's trying to make and the kind of technology that's talking about making, I think it becomes very hard sci fi uh, as far as the thing goes. And maybe for that reason, they're like, mm, mm. it's not really adaptable on that stage because hard sci fi tends to not be very successful, especially for the amount of money that it tends to cost. Hmm. Yeah. Could be a fun film too. Could be fun. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. I'm, I'm watching Foundation at the moment, and oh my god, that 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 is so brilliant. How they do the hard sci-fi there, you know, after not initially, yeah. you know, dealing with it, you know. So. Oh, nice. I I have been meaning to watch that show. I still haven't set up my Apple TV, but <laughs> yeah. I, I go from moments of oh my god, this is the best thing ever to. Please make it stop. <laughs> can, I, can I just divide the story? I, I just want to know about the empire. I, I, I can't cope with anyone else at this moment. I'm taking another break because I, I was getting aggravated uh, with all the other side plots. Oh, I, I will persevere. Slow. <laughs> Speaking <laughs> of a name like Harry Sheldon, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, there, there is a point here about how John Ding led to the disappearance of race. I thought that was pretty cool mm. because everybody's going all over the place, and so uh, most races don't make sense anymore. Um, and and we're five hundred years into the future, so there's enough time for that to happen. So that was really cool. Yeah. Um, there's also the idea of jaunt-assisted suicide, the blue jaunt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my god, yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was a bit cold. <laughs> and in also brilliant. Not 
not to be morbid, but that seems to be like the cleanest way to. So yeah. <laughs> But also, how does it work? Because you've got to visualize the place that you're going to. So how do you do it? Like, we're basically saying doing it in the middle of rock. And, 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 and then kind of these explosions within mountains. So you've got to know what that place is. Like, again, there's there's a couple of moments when I kind of went, you've set up a lot of ideas here, and then you do something with it, and, and then sort of say to the audience, but don't worry about how it actually happens. Yeah. It's, just, it's just an idea <laughs> that I had, you know. And it's basically when they will themselves to die. Yeah. yeah. So you can you can try to join to hell. Is that was that a thing that happened in this book that they wanted to join to heaven or hell and then they didn't make it because those places <laughs> either don't exist or they don't know how to get there. Uh, I mean that's that's a whole separate podcast to think of. <laughs> <laughs> but I, imagine I I think that would happen if suddenly we had this ability of going any anywhere you want to go at will. Yeah. People would end up in yeah, very I strange think places. The, the population yeah. would be decimated. Um, yeah. mm. I think so too. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't buy into the whole the collisions are unlikely thing. Because, yes. Like, how do you guarantee that two people won't visualize the same place on the stage? Like and they did say towards the end that when there was a rush of people jaunting when the bombs came that people collided and blew up <laughs> like, I, first of all i like that that's how a jaunt failed <laughs> you explode <laughs> right, the same place, same time. Nice. Right, so next time uh jared says uh, my dinner's ready here and everybody just says right we'll all just go to jared's house right now you know we, yeah, all, yeah, right. we all end up colliding in exactly the same place at the same time you know <laughs> if you guys show up i'll know jaunting has happened so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's what Travel by train and, and car, you know, the, they, they know better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It's a luxury. But they would not risk, you know, being killed on, on their way to, to work because someone happened to think going in the same place as them at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was the other issue I had. It I found it hard to buy that, one, you... Um, given all the risks associated with it, that people would jaunt as frequently as they do and as purposelessly as they do. Like you want to get from place A to place B really fast. Cool. That that makes sense. We we travel by air all the time, even though it's a death machine. But um the <laughs> uh but with jaunting getting like the dude who was maybe it's because it, it was his job, like the dude who was supposed to make you jaunt double your distance. Uh, and he was jaunting from outside to inside and then from his door to his desk, probably showing off his jaunting abilities. But but using it so purposelessly seems like you're just inviting trouble. And I think it's less likely that so many people would do it so widely. You I don't would, say I it's would... likely that people would just jump from the couch to the fridge and back. <laughs> yeah. I can't see it happening. Oh, yeah. I'm going to the mailbox. Be right back. Oh, the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are people still complaining about putting the bins out? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't I'm know, sure I, you, could talk, you could talk about that uh, or travel like that. That the 1910s, 1920s, when it was considered very dangerous, they'd be looking at people how many people travel by air, going like. It's, what are people doing? Like, I just turn up yeah. when they get carried on the plane and then they arrive at the mm. destination and they don't take headphones off. Like, mm. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's to your point, Vasher, about that. It, I kind of, um, I kind of like automatically, uh, no prize it in my head where I automatically explain how this stuff would, would mm. work when he doesn't explain it that mm-hmm. well in, in, the, in the book. I go, well, they must have some sort of jaunt. Con- John traffic control, you know, <laughs> like around those pads, and they must have, you know, I, I automatically put that stuff in myself mm-hmm. for some reason, you know. <laughs> yeah. And now, now that you bring it up, I'm like, oh yeah, I guess, I guess it wasn't mm-hmm. really that well explained, but the, I kind of just yeah. do that myself while I'm reading it. And I don't mm-hmm. know if the the prose encourages that in this kind of mm-hmm. situation, or if I just do that myself, you know. But <laughs> yeah, I I guess I mean I know I I do that too, Jared, often. And um, my 
my approach is like find all, all the reasons <laughs> before i decide this is not good enough but uh but the um but he does if he didn't mention collisions at all i'm like yeah cool but he does talk about it and someone gives a calculation about how the probability of collision is so low and that's why you can jaunt safely mm. but then you don't go on to say what they are doing to manage collisions other than the field is so big that you're unlikely to collide with anyone but it, <laughs> yeah anyway <laughs> uh, well i think that, there are that, quite that, a lot of um, sorry no, I go think ahead. There are quite a lot of things in this book that are just because I can, you yeah. know, like many characters will do things just because they can. Mm. And at the end, there is uh, when the character, when Foil is talking to the weird android, that android says, um, why will you do it? What for? Because you are alive, sir. You may as well ask why is life. Yeah. Don't ask about it. Leave it. And that seems to be the premise throughout the whole book. Like people will just do things because they can. And when I uh, reached that sentence, I thought, like, ah, perhaps that's why they just shunned carelessly. Mm. It's because they can. And many times, even we just do things because we can, because, I don't know, I can spend a whole afternoon reading because I can, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. What did everyone think of the Burning Man and his? Did you see time travel coming? That was really cool. I, I yes. thought the Burning Man throughout the book was really cool as uh, I, I like how yeah. I like how it was tied into the fact that he was like one of the first people to jaunt mm. across space and that tied into his um that little time travel uh um episode i don't know if it was an ability per se i don't think he did it on purpose or anything but it was a but it happened to him mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah so that, that was it was pretty cool i i liked i liked how all that all that worked out i i, I got a bit concerned when i realized it was it was time travel i was like oh how are you gonna explain this now um but i i, I kept reading <clears throat> and uh yeah well done um yeah I, I liked how it was explained. Of course, if you start thinking about it too deep, it just falls apart. Yeah, but I liked how, how it was <laughs> explained and how and then how it tied in to the end. I really enjoyed the ending. I think. Um, yeah, it's really good. The ending yeah. is quite amazing because, as we said, there are a very a lot of things that are quite sloppy throughout the book. Like he sets everything up, and then there are these. Uh, little plot holes there but the ending sequence is perfect like he went back and tied up everything and i was reading and i finished reading it and then i said like no i need to check went back to read it and, and flip the pages to see the scenes and they matched and it was yeah. like he put up on on that sequence everything he put in on the he didn't put up in the other part of the book and uh, i really liked how the you know when the burning man appears and uh, we have the point of view of foil. He just hears the weird noises. And then mm. it's a burning man who hears the weird noises and we have all the printing going wild in the pages. Yeah. I thought that was very well done because it's not only using the words as a medium, but how you present the words as a way to tell what the burning man or show, in this case, what the burning man was experiencing with the synesthesia and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that very good. Yep. Yeah, like like you said, Susanna, when the time travel started, I was really worried we'd meet meet a time loop, and it didn't happen for a long time until he met uh, what was the name, Robin, in the end, in the future, and she tells him an expert told me to tell you, and so it doesn't seem like he was the one to tell her though, or maybe that conversation happened off page, but uh, yeah, that that was a loop, but. It feels intentional, so I'll I'll give him that. I don't I don't like when they accidentally create loops with time travel. Mm -hmm. And and like Livia said, it was very well thought of. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he knew exactly what he was doing. He didn't just come up. Oh, would, wouldn't it be cool if he could time time travel as well? Uh, yeah. yeah, it was a very well thought of book. 
Wow. Where does this uh where does this rank among the books we've read so far? Mm. Number three, I think. Let's start for me. Number four yeah. for me. Number four. Four. Yeah. You don't need to ask what five is. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like five is the same for all. Might be un- yeah, it might be universal. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it ranks higher than uh, Do Android's Dream with Electric Sheep. I was very disappointed with that one. Oh, so. interesting. I think my order is I'd probably put Forever War and Androids together. This one and I Am Legend together. I don't think I can choose between the two. Mm, yeah. And then Cities in Flight will probably stay bottom of the pile until I find a book. Worse than <laughs> That's going to be, you're going to have to rename, rather than this, the SF Masterworks read long series, it's going to be the quest to find a book worse than Cities in Flight. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Um. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Gives us purpose and motivation. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Inspired, <Yes>. by <laughs> Inspired by Gully Inspired by Gully Foyle. It was quite funny because I get bought a few of uh, the books for Christmas, but my wife would try to pick up a few things and then I'm looking at the list going, Oh, that book. Thanks for that. I'll probably, that's on 2031. Uh, we're going to get to that book on. That's the, <laughs> <laughs> the for the present, you know. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Planning ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to read at least until 2031 <laughs> because you have the book now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any, oh, uh, I guess we already talked about the pyre or piety thing. Um, yeah, again, like that was one of the things which I guess I had this issue with cities in flight that you just throw something world or universe destroying in there casually like that. That's that's fine, you know. <laughs> we we just made something that if you think at it can destroy the world and maybe the universe if you have enough or the well maybe not the universe, he didn't go that far, but the solar system if you have enough of it. Do you think I, I I found that was inserted like unnecessarily at that point, and then I start thinking about it. Do you think it's an analogy to jumping itself, because you you have this power that it's um, exactly at will, and it, it, mm. I, I thought it was more for uh, for uh, and, sorry I'm very distracted, mm-hmm. <clears throat> can't articulate anything today. I I, I thought. It was more to kind of reinforce the point of how chanting could destroy humanity because it's the same principle. It's activated by will, um, mm. and we've been talking about uh, about the ways that it could go wrong. Imagine if if everyone could suddenly jump how far uh, they wanted to go and jump into space into the moon. Uh, yeah, it, it's a similar destructive um, mm. power. That yeah. you know, shouldn't maybe that's the message, but that you know people are not prepared to deal with that sort of power, you know, responsibly. Yeah. I wonder if it's similar to um uh mm. like he seems to be playing with the idea that we get these new things introduced to humanity and we have to learn how to use them. And I you know, that probably comes from that 1950s fear of nuclear weapons. We have this mm-hmm. new toy that we need to learn how to play with or else, you know, we're going to blow mm-hmm. ourselves up. Uh, and so maybe uh, jaunting is his also version of that. And now this new toy introduced uh, into the narrative. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that perspective or interpretation of this destructive element they because some of the worlds that um i don't know if he's quite making this point but it seems like a good uh interpretation some of the worlds that um gully ends up on when he's trying to find his way in the space-time uh curvature there is some of the planets that he ends up on 
have life that's just beginning, right? And if humans end up there, they could destroy the potential life that's forming, or they can learn to live with it if they choose to go there even. So yeah, what, what you said, Susanna, makes a lot of sense that like you go out that far, <laughs> everything you do, you need to do responsibly. Yeah. yeah. But it's also like a, a, a MacGuffin of sorts because they keep on alluding to it and they think, well, what is it? What is it? And, were, and at a certain point, even the author's like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. It's just a thing. It's a dangerous right. thing. Just kind of. Don't yeah. Worry about mm-hmm. it. It's your, mm-hmm. you know, your vibranium, your unobtainium, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> unobtainium. Is that a real metal in one of the superhero comics? No. Okay. <laughs> nice. No. <laughs> I love that. This, yeah, I mean, I'd even forgotten about it because I, I, at some point, I started thinking that all the millionaires were after Gully because they wanted the money, um, which, yeah, once he spent it all on his circus, <laughs> there's no point looking for him anymore. But yeah, it wasn't that they needed the pyre. Mm. Oh, well. <laughs> mm-hmm. Any other topics that we should cover? I think we're good. Cool. <laughs> five in the in the vaults. Yes. Five, the vaults. five done. About seventy to go, I think. <laughs> but... Nice. No, there's a lot of hundred and seventy. But yeah, this was this was a good one. I was. We yeah. had two good books after the debacle that was Cities in Flight. <laughs> I want to, I want to, I want to see when. <laughs> <laughs> I went and finished it. I, I did. I, I would. I, I don't know. I, I don't DNF unless something really problematic happens in a book. But I finished it. It wasn't worth it. You all were right to warn me. <laughs> the last, last page is pretty good. I, I definitely have to give it some credit. The last page isn't bad. The last page, yeah, it's not bad. The last page it's the is last one. Idea, yeah, right? and also, you know, he blows up. <laughs> he blows up. That's great. It <laughs> <laughs> uh, must have been very re- re- rewarding to get to the end. Of the end. Oh, oh yeah. It's it's nice. Yeah. It's- <laughs> You get this profound sense of relief. That's all. Yes, relief. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the emotion you want to feel when you finish a book. <laughs> but, but also, also another book that made you want to read kind of Molly Crystal when you got to the end of it. Something else. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Oh, uh, I I just yeah I suppose this one made me want to pick up a twelve hundred page tome. I'm thirty pages into it and. Already, I feel like the writing style is different and a lot better. So I guess it's mo- mostly the lack of information isn't from this book, <laughs> as should be clear by the fact that it's 1,200 pages long. <laughs> oh, so uh, next up, like I mentioned in the beginning, is uh, Babel 17 by Samuel mm-hmm. R. Delaney, which we are... Amazing. Which I already read it. It's amazing. You read it already. Awesome. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm oh, looking good. forward to that. I am actually looking forward to all three of the next books uh, because I've been wanting to read Gene Wolf for a while. Fifth Head mm-hmm. of Cerberus seems like a good intro yeah. to that. A lot of light. Uh, ever since I heard about the premise, I'm really curious to see how he deals with that. And Fable 17, I don't know much about, but Livia says it's good. And it's so I, um, oh, it's, it's extremely the, original. Uh... Yeah, it's extremely original. Like uh, the whole thing about how they travel in a space is mm. not your Navy oriented thing. Mm. It's very unique. Nice. Nice. Cool. Yeah. I'm curious. Eager for that. So once again, if you'd like to join us on these discussions, please consider checking out the Patreon forum and we'll let everyone tell us where they can, where we can find them and their books. Chris, would you like to start us off this time? Uh, yeah, my name is Chris Moore. You can find me on my YouTube channel where I mainly talk about movies at the moment. Uh, although I should have a top five-ish books of the year thing coming in the next couple of days. Uh, but other than that, find me on the Patreon forums. Uh, my next Jared at the Fantasy Thinker uh, YouTube 
Uh, I did my top five a day ago. So, um, <laughs> and uh, you can find me the page chewing forums as well. And uh, Livia. Yeah, I'm Livia. Thank you. And uh, I host a books and down podcast. You can find it on YouTube and almost every other platform. I'm on Twitter, threads, and Instagram as Livia J. Elliot, and also on the page chewing forums. And my stories are available in Android for now and having news coming soon. Nice. Uh, I usually uh, on page chewing forums and X um, and you can find my books pretty much everywhere they are now on sale on Amazon for the next couple of days the ebooks only 99 cents each so go grab them nice go check them out and you can find me on my YouTube channel reading by the rainy mountain and I hang out on the page chewing forum all the time where apparently my new name is The Disruptor. So we will see <laughs> everyone in a month. Uh, thank you so much for watching or listening. Uh, bye. <laughs>